You get told how to work to be successful, never give up, continue working, but no one ever teaches you how to fail. I was obviously uh, growing up in South Africa during a very tumultuous time, and so we didn't have access to you know, great culture during this apartheid era, which was obviously a very difficult time for us as a country. I came, as I said, you know, to this country with 100 pounds and a dream, and I knew nobody apart from one girlfriend from South Africa. All I did every single day is I visualize where I want to be. When you sell other people's products, it's yes. like a mouse on the wheel. You know, you're always just coming up with new campaigns and getting your clients on the front page of Vogue. And so for me, I just had this yearning that if I was making my clients' brands successful and I was generating revenue, I was generating brand equity. I was like, what could I do? If I had my own company, if I had my own product on a shelf. And so I started manifesting that. And Facium came to me in a vision. Sorry, when you say it came to you in a vision, yeah. what does that mean? Ayahuasca. <gasps> Inga. Hi. Welcome to Millennial Mind. I'm very, very happy to have you here. And thank you for making the time for me. I know you've been in New York, you flew back from Paris last night, you're going yeah. to Singapore. Uh, you have crazy. so much going on and you made the time and I'm, I'm so grateful because I think Facetune is a very iconic brand. I was actually telling someone yesterday, a guy actually yesterday, um, that I'm interviewing you and he was like, oh my God, I just bought their products. Oh really? Oh yeah. good, we're really the growing. And the ball, but that was from a like, you know, stereotypically an Indian guy who's like 30, uh, I would never expect it. One of the fastest growing sectors for us is men actually. Yeah. It's very fast, it's very interesting. It's, and you know, I think it's because, you know, if you give them the permission, mm. men really want to take care of their skin. And so by calling it a gym, it just doesn't yes. sound so feminine like a facial. You know, I don't think a lot of men, maybe even Indian yes. men, are ready to say, oh, I'm just going for my facial. But 100%. actually taking your face to the gym, that, like, you should do that every week. Makes sense, no? Yeah, that's so powerful. I never thought about it in that way because I think, like you said, giving yourself permission. I talk around gender roles a lot and how we are putting people into boxes and therefore some people who want to look after themselves are unable to because they feel it's too feminine or they feel it's out of the norm. But I want to go back to the beginning. So sure. tell me, you, you went to uni, what did, or did you go to uni, uni? No. Sorry, that was an assumption. I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> so you finished school. I finished school. Um, I went. To, I was obviously uh, growing up in South Africa during a very tumultuous time, mm -hmm. um, and so we didn't have access to you know great culture um, mm -hmm. during this apartheid era, which was obviously a very difficult time for us as a country. Um, and so I used to watch a lot of CNN because that's sort of the only thing we could get our hands on. And so I right. thought originally I'd be a a war correspondent. Anything okay. to sort of get out of the country, you know, when you don't believe in the in the politics and you're just stuck in a in a in a in a way of life. So for me, it was always just about getting out. So I, I did leave um, mm -hmm. in uh, when I was uh, eight, 17 years old, and I came to the UK um, to follow my dream of um, working for CNN. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so when I arrived here, um, I, I sort of started at the London College of Printing for a couple of weeks, but I met a man called uh, Chris Evans, okay, who had just bought Virgin Radio. And he's like, what do you want to be? And I, at this point, I decided actually, I was having so much fun in London, maybe the war zones could wait. Okay. And I wanted <laughs> to become the Ruby Wax of radio and I told him and he thought it was hysterical and he's like come and just be a runner at Virgin Radio okay trust me you're getting hands-on experience so I, I sort of started and stopped immediately right. um, and I started working with Chris Evans and Jonathan Ross at Virgin Radio and that's really just where my sort of passion for media and um, storytelling con you know sort of came to life at the end of the day that's what I really wanted to do that's so powerful and then and so then I stayed there, um, you know, it uh, wasn't very long before I then got um, asked to do a TV show on Channel 4. So I moved to um, Norwich. Um, so I had like a teen show um, called That Film Show on Channel 4, late night, 11 o'clock slot. Oh, wow. And my job was just traveling the world, meeting incredible people, doing um, junkets, doing um, movie junkets at film festivals. So I managed to meet an incredible amount of people. Mm -hmm. Again, tell really interesting stories, really hone the craft of, um, you know, 
relationship building mm. and storytelling, as I said. And so um, did that for a while, then pivoted into using some of those relationships to create a branding company looking after a lot of um, high-end luxury jewelry brands, etc. I sold that company wow. six years later. Um, because I really was desperate to create my own product. I'd, right. You know, when you sell other people's products, it's yes. like a, a, a mouse on the wheel. You know, you're okay. always just coming up with new campaigns and yeah. getting your clients on the front page of Vogue. You could, like, every month there's just something more. And so mm. for me, I just had this yearning that if I was making my clients' brands successful and I was generating revenue, I was generating brand equity, uh, through all of my, um, you know, some of, some of them were award-winning campaigns. I was like, what could I do if I had my own company, if I had my own product on a shelf? And so oh I started manifesting that. That is so powerful. I can't believe that. That's amazing. I mean, you, you, the journey you've described is kind of a bit like a dream. I always feel like when people say I came here and then I, I kind of was a radio presenter, then it was a TV presenter, and then you were four years undercover Right. But, oh, yeah. But before that, I <laughs> suppose that only really came about because great. That was probably the most prolific time of my life. OK. Working um, with Julian de Bono on the on the FT. But again, I, I suppose um, great things only come from great failure. So when a when a door closes on you, a, you know, it's normally that's when something really exciting like the FT came and, and that door for me was um, I'd invented a board game called Hollywood Domino. So when I sold Bleach Media, I was like, okay, I'm going to manifest. I'm going to create something. What's that thing? I, at the time, everyone was making cashmere jumpers. I was like, maybe I'll go into jewelry. Maybe I'll do jeans. Like everyone was doing the luxury, like really mm -hmm. expensive jeans. I arrived in LA got invited to a party. Everyone was playing a board game and I knew instinctively that that's exactly what I was going to do. And so I was like, you're having such a laugh with me up there. This is ridiculous. I know this is what you're asking me to do. Okay. And so I reinvented Domino's. I'd never played it before in my life. We okay. reinvented it. Within nine months, we sold it to Hasbro. And so then we did, I moved to Los Angeles. Um, we had the TV deals with Ridley Scott. I mean, it was out of oh a my movie. Oh my gosh. And so um, we were then launching that in Walmart stores, about a few, like a couple of hundred Walmart stores. Uh, so again, I thought I'd invented Monopoly. I was like, oh my God, this is it. This is the biggest in invention as an entrepreneur. You're, you're always believing that this one's gonna be the one. Yeah. And all the signs, the early signs were that this was literally going to be the thing I'd make all my money on. And then it arrived, and I think they call it dead on arrival. So it was during the biggest crash um, that happened, obviously, 2008, 2009. Yes. And so literally my dreams came crashing down. And I think what's so hard these days ooh, for entrepreneurs is that um, – you get told how to work to be successful, never give up, continue working, but no one ever teaches you how to fail. Mm. And so I think at that point, how to deal with the time, money, public humiliation, the failing of mm -hmm. something so big and losing all your dreams, I think it sends you into a tailspin. And so certainly for me, I'd stopped sleeping, I'd stopped eating. I'd, my, 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 my relationship with my boyfriend ended and I was sort of living in Los Angeles in a total mess. And so I think I just really had to bring it back down to basics for me. And that meant just starting with the basics, like I needed to learn how to sleep again because that worry and anxiety and yeah. stress was so immense. And so normal people would probably go and see a doctor or a therapist. I was mm -hmm. like, no, I've got to go to India, obviously. <laughs> that's, that's how I'm going to deal with my sleeping. Okay. So a one-way ticket to Rishikesh to learn how to meditate. Wow, this is like Eat, Pray, Love all over again. Yeah, I love sound it. of it. <laughs> it's my favorite movie, by the way. That is so powerful. So when you were in India, you what did you learn? You learned how to meditate and sleep, I presume. Learned how to meditate. And that's when Gillian de Bono called to say, what are you doing 
And I was like, I'm learning to sleep. I'm Who's learning Julian to eat. Debole? She was the editor of the FT, How to Spend It. Right. So she was like, because she had done a huge article on me because what other female entrepreneur had invented a board game and had every major big celebrity in Los Angeles play it? Like, it was nuts. Okay. And she's like, what are you doing on digital? Everyone was talking about digital. I was like, I don't know. I'm just a spa junkie right now. I'm just trying to keep it together, regain my life, figure it out. Like, and she called me back and she went, you know what? The whole world feels like you. There are bankers who are leaving their city jobs in droves to go and climb Kilimanjaro. Mm -hmm. You took the bull by the horn. You've got one-way tickets traveling the world to become well again, to find your balance. Will you write about it? And so I was like, okay, but you know, I'm dyslexic. I can't write. And she's like, I'll mentor you. And at first she was like, I, I used to write this and it was literally like, therapy it was so cathartic she'd write back going this is not really a story Inga this is kind of like a, a, a love letter to your ex or something you probably <laughs> need a therapist right but um so really the the spa junkie just came at the right time I had the right message and again then I learned back to that storytelling but yeah. through print through copy and an incredible editor Maria Schollenberger who really helped me with my comedic timing as well. So where wellness can be so earnest, I was undercover. I managed to bring everything I'd learned and bring back that desire to actually make things very humanized and very relatable, bringing that humor. And so my, my dream of um, being Ruby Wax sort of came to <laughs> life. So it was very funny, you know, um, and then that was really prolific. It was actually 10, 12 years of writing My for gosh. them traveling the world. I can't was amazing. believe that. I love how you just said in the conversation, you just said to her, look, I'm a spa junkie right now. And she said, great, that's going to be the name. That's it. The next <gasps> minute so there was powerful. a page this big in the newspaper introducing the, the, the latest columnist, you know, and they, obviously I was undercover. No one knew right. who I was, but the content was so different. It was so rich. It was just a woman out there. And because it was so raw, it was so authentic. Oh I think gosh. it really um, it resonated. And so people still come to me today and they're like, all I ever read, I bought the magazine so I could read Spa Junkie. No way. Yeah. Something that's really powerful that you're saying is that you were kind of connected with a lot of white people, right? You've just mentioned a lot of names. And a lot of people ask me, Shivani, how do you get certain people on your podcast? Or how do you connect with the right people? How did you connect with the right people at the right time so that they could give you these opportunities? I mean, you you have to you have to manifest them. There is just no right. You can't plan that kind of thing. You know, yeah. I came, as I said, you know, to this country with a hundred pounds and a dream, and the only contact I had was of a man called who I had a restaurant called Poor Boys Diner. Bye. So I worked as a waitress when I first arrived, and I knew nobody apart from one girlfriend from South Africa. So it's just, you know, you've got to work hard. By working hard, you create more opportunities. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, more opportunities get you in the right place at the right time. You know, I, I, I was lucky, but I was lucky because I made it happen. Exactly. I think yeah. the luck is when it's opportunity meets preparation. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. And if you're prepared, you'll have that conversation because you've sought out that opportunity. And I was listening to something actually recently and it said, um, people always say like, I don't understand why I'm always hurt by other people, right? Because I don't hurt other people, but we don't know who we've hurt. We don't know who's hurting us. And that made me reflect to think that often the actions we put out, sometimes they don't necessarily come back to us from those same people. And what I mean by that is, recently I've been asked to go on a lot of podcasts and sometimes I really do say, like, read the message and think, I'm going to get back to it. I'm going to get back to it. And I don't. And today, there were a couple of people that I messaged that hadn't got back to me. And when I listened to that, thinking about how necessarily the people who love you, you won't love, or necessarily the people you hurt, they won't hurt you. The story was, like, everything you put out will come back to you in some way, shape, or form, whether that's love or hate or whatever. If you put out hate to let me say I put out hate to you, doesn't mean you're gonna hate me, but some form of hate will come back to me. If I put love out to you, doesn't mean you're gonna love me, but some form of love will come back Karma. to me. Right. And it made me think that, okay, let me just 
make sure I'm doing good and let me reply to all of those people. So I stopped my gym session. <laughs> I literally found all those people. And then just now before you arrived, the person who I really wanted on this podcast messaged me. Great. And I really just think that, you know, that made me feel that are we acting in the way we want to be treated? You know, am I acting in the way that I want to be treated? Sometimes I really do miss it and it's, it's no bad intent. But I should reply even to say like not this month, next month, because ultimately it's me who wants that from other people. And that really made me feel about your point in terms of you, know, you come to this country, you, you make connections because you're putting out good in the world. You're working really hard. You're trying to find the dots. You're not just waiting for it to come to you. But I think manifestation, I think, is really uh, certainly for me, because as I said, it, it comes to me in a different form. As I said, mm -hmm. at the time, I just knew I wanted to create a product business. Right. In my wildest dreams, would I have imagined it was going to be a board game? Um, but all I did every single day is I visualize where I want to be. So when I go running, mm. I, I put my intention out. When I do yoga, I put my intention out. Um, when I do chanting, I put my intention out and everyone, you know, who would ever tell you, oh, you can't do all of the spiritual for financial um, or, or business is not true. You right. literally need to be mindful, single minded about what you want in your life. And, you know, for me, business isn't business. Business is my life. I am defined by whatever job I'm doing because I spend 95% of my time, certainly 12 hours a day, my screen time will show you. So if I'm not, work is is who I am at mm. that time. So I have to basically be manifesting that. So I visualize and then whenever, as I said, I'm, I'm doing anything, I try and imagine what success looks like and I bring it back and I bring it back. And you have to reinvent every week, like, you know, the world is a very, very tough place. Yeah. And you just have to keep coming back to what is it I'm trying to achieve here um, and what is the fastest way to get there um, with the least amount of, of, of expense. And then you just basically manifest it, see it. You've got to also then believe it. Mm. And then you have a much better chance of, of having it happen. I heard recently someone saying that they Photoshop themselves in places and outlets that they want to be in. So if they want to be on the cover of Vogue, they'll Photoshop themselves in it and then put it on their vision board. And I thought that was so powerful because I think a lot of people say, I want to be rich. Well, what, what does rich mean? Where's the specifics? So I think with manifesting, you have to be really, really specific. And that requires so much internal reflection and work. Yeah. Because we all want to be successful. We all want to have love. We all want to do well. Yeah. I mean, if I'm, I would, one advice I would give is if you, if you want to be rich starting your own business, that's not enough. Mm. You're going to want to make a big change because somewhere on your journey, you're going to fall apart. Yeah. At, at least once. If you're the, one of the luckiest people, it's it's normally like a, a sev like when you're fundraising. There, yeah. There's just so many crises mm. that if you're just doing it for the money, you just it, yeah. what you, it doesn't give you enough reason to stay. You've got to want to know that what you're doing is powerful, meaningful, and you're changing lives. I completely agree. I so think. whoever that person is, tell them they're blocking <laughs> up the wrong tree. They should go work for someone. I say because if you want to be rich. Go and work for someone. Don't don't like don't take don't take it on yourself. I was having this conversation with someone yesterday to say that there's no point in doing something if it doesn't align with you. So what someone was saying, you know, like I'm just going to start posting this stuff because it's going to get me more followers and that's going to get me to my goal. And I was like, you're doing it for the wrong reason. Like, don't give up your authenticity for clout. Don't give it up. Like, yeah. you whatever you want to do, you do it with your heart and then it will come. Like, don't switch everything up right now because you think this is what's trending or this is what's popular. Do what is right for you. But I want to talk about Face Gym. Tell me how you founded Face Gym. So, uh, you know, going back to that journey that I was on traveling the world, obviously I got very, very spiritual. Mm. Um, I had lots, of, I had access to every single facialist and, you know, both holistic and, and very advanced as well. Um, and at the time I started also designing some spas so I was working on the Fayena Spa okay. um, and designing that. And it was during that time that I actually realized that, um, you know, trying so many different treatments and doctors and, and injectables, again, the column wanted innovation. And that was the only innovation at the time. 
And so I really wanted to bring her back to basics again. And because uh, my face just, you know, was really starting to suffer. I feel like I'd aged okay. from all of the injectables uh, and that kind of advanced work that I was doing. So I went to Mexico, worked with an amazing man called Bobby Klein. Because um, at the time, you know, I talk about this quite a bit in, in some of my articles, but I actually started getting a little bit addicted without realizing so, you know, every time you look in the mirror, like, oh, you know, mm. oh, I've got some wrinkles there. Because what you don't realize is you're just chasing your tail around your face or your body because everything has a consequence. If you inject Botox here, then it's going to make your face move here, which creates wrinkles here. So then you have to inject there. And oh. then it's just this vicious circle. And as I said, I, I'm not anti anything, but I think at the time I was really just you know, experimenting too much. And I often quote myself as saying I was the human Petri dish. So I worked with uh, Bobby Klein um, in Mexico and Facetum came to me in a vision. And literally, again, as I said, I manifest quite strongly. Um, I think it was in, within two weeks of having the vision with my shaman, um, I Selfridge has called me to say, we are doing something big in beauty. Um, we know that you write for the FT because at this point it, the word had got out a little bit. Um, what's new and amazing? And I went, well, what's new and amazing is this thing called face gym. And they were like, well, we need it. And I was like, okay. And so that was probably the, it was the most exciting, but also the most uh, like daunting because I was in Mexico. I didn't even live in London anymore. And I had to come back to London and that was January, and I launched in May, the 1st of May. Oh, So I had four months to gosh. raise the money, come up with the concept, create the logo, and there was just me and my two assistants. So. And how did you do that? And sorry, when you say it came to you in a vision, yeah. what does that mean? Ayahuasca. <gasps> yeah. This is why I want to try ayahuasca. I'm like, so that's crazy. Yeah. I'm a very big believer in in um, in plant medicine. Yes. When when you're when you need it, like yes. you know, at the time, as I said, I'm all about reinvention. I never normally stay in any area for longer than six years. I normally give myself a, ch a challenge. Okay. Like with um, you know, with the television and radio, um, I did that for six years. It was mm. amazing. Tick that box. That was great. Was that going to be my future? I didn't think so. Okay. Then with the, the media business, again, I just didn't want to be client facing. I didn't want to say the same thing. And I, I realized at that point, I didn't want to be a CEO working in an office environment. I had something like, you know, 40 staff and I just realized that wasn't for me. So mm -hmm. I reinvented that, sold that after six years. You know, we've spoken about everything else. So I think I believe in re resetting and re and, and re and re, re realigning. And so sometimes when you're very lost, yes. And I always r remind people, you know, when you're at channel and uh, our channel five, um, at Heathrow Terminal Five, and you're in the holding bay, and they're like, "Really sorry, guys, our parking spot isn't available. We're gonna have to go around in circles for the next hour." And sometimes that's how your life can feel. You're just not landing. You're not landing ideas, you're not landing your relationships, you're not landing your business, you're not landing the fundraising, nothing lands mm. for you. And that time, sometimes you need more help and that can come in a variety of different ways. That could be therapy, it could be mentorship, it could be, um, you know, a good board. Right. Um, but for me, it always goes back to trying to go back to the beginning. So I normally retreat back to my spiritual world, mm -hmm. my incredible shaman, um, and on this occasion, plant medicine, yeah. How powerful. So you thought of face gym and that name came to you? or the Yeah, no, the name. The name and the logo. What? That's yeah. so powerful. Yeah. I've heard so many people talk around ayahuasca. I watched the interview with Will Smith. And that really, and after that, I watched so many interviews around ayahuasca. Because I think often when you, like you said, you're in a bit of a, in a lull period. Yeah. And you're like, what am I doing? Like, where is this going? I'm just so confused. I think so many people have gone and it's given them clarity, but I think you have to go with an intention. You Absolutely. can't just go to just see how it goes. <clears throat> right? And and again, I just want, again, I, I, I don't want to be the poster girl for ayahuasca because <laughs> my story obviously ended incredibly well, but there yes. are some other stories yes. that didn't end so well. So it's always very important to, A, I think goes close to the source. So mm. you've got to do it, you know, uh, as I said, I do Mexico, Peru, 
normally when I, when I go, I go with very trusted people. Yes. I research it very, very heavily. Okay. It's the right shaman for you. So my first um, shaman was female. Okay. Um, and I did, I put lots of time and energy and I had my close friends around me. So yeah, again, you if you have to, you can't just sort of like, oh, book a trip because <laughs> anything can happen and lots so of things true. can go wrong. And, and not anyone else, I don't haven't met anyone else who basically founded a business five months later from ayahuasca. So again, yes. it's my it's, it's my story. story. Yeah. Um, so certainly don't want to be, you know, promoting <laughs> that. But I again I think it should be an option for you if yes. you are feeling if you are feeling lost. And if you are not really ready to take that step, I just wanted to tell you yes. about my sponsor, Heights. <laughs> so Heights is a brain care pill. And okay. I have been taking them for the last six weeks now. They're founded by Dan and you just need to take two in the morning. And what it really helps with is brain fog. Okay. And it really helps with your mood and it really helps what with are your the energy ingredients? and your sleep. B12. Okay. Uh, I know it also has omega-3s. They're vegan because I'm vegetarian, so I can never really find tablets that contain omega-3 and all those fatty acids. It's actually got 20 uh, vitamins, minerals, and antioxidants, but I can't name you all of them. <laughs> but I've really actually found that they've really helped me, Amazing. especially with my sleep, especially with my energy, and with that brain fog. So before, and we promote ayahuasca, let's promote <laughs> heights first. <laughs> It, baby steps. Baby steps, exactly. Start with heights and then slowly, <laughs> slowly move to ayahuasca. So you got the call from Selfridges. You had four months. Tell me, how did you do everything? So um, my wonderful uh, kind of right hand is still with me, Hetty, um, and I basically sat together. We had t countless lunches um, and we basically found someone because I knew exactly what I wanted to to do as I said you know it was a warm-up mm -hmm. cardio sculpting cool down because I wanted to have those early adopters understand so I thought right lots of us go to the gym lots of us understand the power of actually working out our muscles because mm -hmm. it's so obvious when you take your face to your body to the gym you see great results, not just muscle results, but you also see skin results. Mm -hmm. By training regularly, you reduce cellulite, toxins, uh, water retention, and you don't, your skin just gets much more toned and taut. Right. So it's a tremendous amount of skin benefits from working out as well. So I thought if I can apply that to the face and give people a rhythm that they already understand. So within our workout is warm up where we literally, you know, manipulate the muscles, we see what's going on, we get the blood flow going, bringing mm -hmm. all that oxygen uh, to the skin, you know, starting to activate the collagen and the fibroblast production. Um, and then we'd go into cardio where we're just, you know, removing all of the toxins, that's the sugar, the salt, the stress that, that creates the water retention. And then on a, you know, drain all of that and then sort of start with your face and sculpting the muscles, which is really the the weight session mm. on a clean canvas and then a cool down. And so that resonated. Mm. We launched, um, as I said, you know, in Selfridges. It was, I, I created the workout with a couple of um, experts, raised a bit of money, which was challenging, but an EIS scheme helped me at the time. So there's always lots of really good schemes that the government has. So I think anyone who's wanting to um, set up something, yeah. uh, definitely look at some of these schemes. So I, I, I raised 250,000 on EIS and uh, launched in Selfridges and we were, it was an enormous success. We had queues around the block. As I said, there, it was, a, there was no pushback. It was just, wow. we probably got, I don't know, I mean, five, six, 10 million pounds worth of free PR. I came out as the spa junkie, as Inga, face gym. This is basically after all those years of traveling the world this is what she says you should be doing and so yeah that's just how it really started there needs to be a movie made about you oh i'm literally like <laughs> oh my god this can't be real and now you have celebrities you have 11 global studios you have oh i think even more, more? because now yeah so now we're um i mean we've, we've got these the travel channel that's exploding for us right. as well okay so that's like claridge's soho house yes. farmhouse yes. we're opening our second studio in, yes um, you must have more actually yeah, yeah you do on your website it says 11 global studios but that's probably like the, the face gym the, ones the, exactly then you incorporated in so exactly. many different places exactly my gosh and you've got exactly. carly Kloss, adriana lima lizzo everyone's doing it how I, did that happen 
I, you know, I think, again, it's just the right message at the right time. Uh, I've got to say a huge thanks to my creative director, um, Alistair Willis, who is now the creative director at Adidas. I mean, he really, really helped me because I, I, the day I started Fashion, which was the 1st of May, I was pregnant with my first daughter in October. So I basically had two kids and Fashion and that expansion at the same time. So there were moments where I was definitely off, My off piece. Gosh. So I think, you know, he really helped me um, create the environment and the brand. So that was great. And it just attracted a lot of, of, star, of stars. I think my background, if I think about all those different career paths, they all led me to be able to create a concept, package it up. And then I know how to put that little bow on. I know how mm. to get a celebrity. I know how to get them excited because I wrote for the FT. I know what a journalist is looking for. So I design skincare uh, products, treatments, A, because if it's not good enough for the FT to write about, it's not good enough for my customer. Okay. And so again, it's just 20 years of honing that storytelling, that marketeering, mm -hmm. that understanding and being blisteringly clear on what your customer is looking for, yes. understanding trends in the market and then seeing gaps and then running at them at full speed. Wow. I'm, I'm a bit speechless, actually. I'm just so <laughs> inspired by you. I have to ask, and I'm not asking you this because you're a woman. I just want to make that really clear to all my listeners. But having two children while starting a business is incredibly tough for either parent. Yeah. But especially as a mother, I feel, yeah. because a lot of the unpaid work falls on a mother. Yes. How did you manage that? Badly. I mean, I think they were certainly looking back. I didn't take any maternity leave. And so I had two cesarean sections because we had um, a small crisis in the beginning, mm -hmm. an emergency birth. And so I was at work. I mean, I've got pictures 24 hours after cesarean in my bed, literally, because we had to open a studio. I've got the pictures to prove it. My husband sends them to me all the time. I'm like, I cannot. I was figuring out how to breastfeed. You know, Lauren Barnett, God bless her, she's our VIP manager. I must have been like, get someone in. Hello. <laughs> and I, I, the second child, uh, a CC who's five now, you know, we were launching that same week, um, the King's Road. So I was in the King's Road, clearing out the dust, helping to paint. I went in for labor and I was back out again one week in. And I think in hindsight now, with any entrepreneurs, you've got to give women that time. If they want to take six months or nine months or a year off, if I think about my hormonal imbalance at work, my mood swings, I'm not the person I am today. There was definitely a period of time where it was so overwhelming having mm -hmm. two under under three. And, and Facetime was there as well, opening studios in America. And you're just not yourself because hormonally – you can't deal. I go back to that not being taught how to fail, not be like my, I was opening my first studio, the biggest frost of New York had ever ha that had ever happened happened. The studio frosted over. The oils froze. We couldn't on the launch week. And you, when you're emotional, you've got two little kids. You're not sleeping. Your hormones are out of whack. You've never taken the time to actually appreciate how your body has changed. Yeah. And so I think the way you respond and react to crisis is nuts and you just look like an absolutely crazy emotional wreck. woman wreck <laughs> total wreck and then me. you're not a good mother you're not a good wife you're not a good colleague and so in hindsight i think that's something i would definitely regret not yeah. taking proper time um but anyway, I'm here today. I've got two great kids and <laughs> face them. You know, we're going through crisis for crisis, you know, yeah. pandemic to recession. <laughs> Talk to me about the pandemic. Oh, yeah. Actually, for us, it turned out to be probably one of the most defining moments of my career. I discovered my tenacity. I remember locking the doors, giving all my all my staff a hug, even though it was illegal. Um retreating to the countryside and thinking that was like the biggest waste of my time, energy and money. And more was the fact that I missed my kids. My Like I didn't take the kids, like my other mum friends to all those classes, all those hours. That was the yeah. regret or the regret of not having my kids close to me. But again, I had a great board, great people around me who went, pick yourself up, pull your stuff together. 
and you're coming back with a plan in a week. And we pivoted the business. I did. I literally called my team. We huddled together. We had wine. We cried. We were like, we've got a great product. Let's deconstruct it. Let's go digital. Like, let's use Instagram. We had 50,000 yeah. followers. By the time we've emerged, you know, with kind of over almost like almost 2 million followers across the channels. And again, but it came from a place of we're scared. We want to connect with you. We know you're scared and you want to connect with someone mm. instead of sitting there drinking ourselves to oblivion. What if we all connected through facial exercise? Tell your friends, group together. Yeah. And that basically changed the business. We then realized quickly we had a, um, a desire for, for, for skincare. It sort of catapulted us into skincare. So that was um, a, it was a very difficult moment. And I think it cost us from a financial perspective, you know, to try and keep the company alive and keep all of our staff there. But yeah. from a strategic perspective, it helped us grow. You talk so passionately about your team. I've, throughout this podcast, I've never heard someone name exactly the people who they've interacted with throughout their life so much. And I uh, think that's so powerful because it really shows your appreciation for each individual. Oh, and they're journey. still all with me, yes. And I wanna ask you, how do you hire the right people? Oh, I'm the worst at hiring. <laughs> I really am, because, but I do find um, some great talent. You know, like even the, the, the talent that I hired, at Bleach Media, mm -hmm. um, they've all gone off to do enormous things. They've all gone off to build it, their own businesses, which I'm so proud of. Um, you know, at Face Gym, as I said, I've I've met them on CEOs and stuff. It's quite difficult, but yeah. on on people in the bunker with me, because again, I'm, I'm not a I'm not really a great CEO. I put my hand up. I'm much more of a in the weeds, okay. visionary. I need to be on the street. I need to smell. I'm in the shops. Okay, like. I'm in Selfridges on the weekend going, what's happening? That's not good. This isn't working. <laughs> I'm not in an office. I need okay. to be on the street. Yeah. Um, you know, because I'm obviously, you know, what do they call it? Like I'm uh, not not trained. I'm not a, I'm, yeah. I'm not a, uh, a Harvard graduate. So for me, I really am in a from the gut, intuitive, mm. um, and I, but I think in today's today's culture, it's important to have someone that understands what's actually happening out there. Uh, you can sort of lose touch with your customer, and when you lose touch with their customer and what they need, you're you you know you're on a slippery slide down to oblivion. Honestly, I, I'm not surprised all those people turned into make their own amazing companies because the way you speak, I don't know if it's you've perfected the power of storytelling or whatever <laughs> it is, you seem like a very good mentor and one who is like, I've made this mistake, let's change it. Or like, I recognize this, let's change it. Or someone who is just not willing to give up. That's what I see from you. It's like you all go through anything. We have, I mean, listen, the, the journey is still long. Face Gym has still struggling. Like, you know, again, like all companies now as we hit the biggest recession, yeah. gas prices, who knows where we'll end up. But if, if it all goes great, it's because no one worked harder. And if it all fails, <laughs> it's because I gave it everything I had. You know what I mean? But at the end of the day, you can't have any regrets. Yeah. So if you gave it your all and at the end of the day, it just didn't fly or you didn't raise the money, as long as mm -hmm. you can go to sleep knowing I did everything to make sure that my team was there um, and and I and I looked after my shareholders and myself and my family. Yeah. Then you can you can rest easy. And then, as I said, the one thing I know is that after every great um, failure, it's just the beginning of a really another great journey. And you yeah. can't fail. You can only learn. Mm -hmm. And so you just have to. Every one of my failures has just made me, you know, better. And Fashion wouldn't have been here today if I didn't fail at all the others. Amazing. And if fail, you know, whatever happens with Fashion, the next journey will have learned from all of this. So you just have to keep learning, and it's and also enjoy the process. I think sometimes I have to tell myself that all the time, is that, you know, you these things. It's a ten year run to mm -hmm. do anything and if you're going to be miserable and stressed for 10 years go work for someone else yeah. so enjoying that moment leaning into the pain finding mm -hmm. happiness in the pain coming together and as I said I'm sure a lot of the people that worked with me when I was post-pregnancy <laughs> probably think I'm a lunatic and I was <laughs> um, but today no today you can't do anything without a great team behind you um, so it's, it can be robust but and passionate but yeah 
I can see that. I'm going to call you all the time to be like, motivate me. I'm really so upset. Just help me out. <laughs> so before we close, yeah. is, I'm actually quite sad. I feel like we have so much more we could have dive, dived into. Oh, we can always do another one. We can. I do a truth or dare. Which would you like to choose? Um, your makeup looks way too good. I'm not going to make you do. <laughs> you know the dare. <laughs> do a face and work out with me. Um, I'll give you some advice. I'll do okay. the truth. What's the best piece of advice you've ever received? I think probably, there's probably two pieces. I okay. think stop trying to be a perfectionist because you waste time. And I think just do, you know, sort of show you in real, real t terms how that manifests itself. Um, by being a perfectionist right now, like, I was like, oh, guys, you know, the packaging is really bothering me. Yeah. I'm kind of over it. I mean, we're one years old. What is wrong with you? I'm like, you know, it's the font. It's the this. I, I just think we need to rethink it. And it's that never ending wanting to perfect. Meanwhile, we've just won gold at the number one packaging awards. And it's that mentalness. We were like, oh, crikey, I'm focusing on all the wrong things because I'm trying to be a perfectionist. And when I was doing my film career, um, I can't even remember who the director was. Um, but they were like, the biggest piece of advice someone told them is, at some point you've got to stop editing. Because you to make that movie incredible, mm -hmm. you will just can continue, it can go on for years. So at some point you've just got to trust, believe you've done enough, make it good, get it out, Stick with it. Stop obsessing be with stuff that just doesn't matter. Yeah. Because ultimately you're spending time, energy on the wrong stuff, um, which is costing your business. Um, so if it's good, get it out and then improve on the job. So there could always be a point two, point three. I mean, 100%. are we on our number 14th of our <laughs> Apple? Just get the so darn true. thing out there. Learn whilst it's out there and improve I think that was that was key and then I think um one thing I learned late as I said culture and and emo like being being a woman in business is it's so important no matter how passionate you are emotional it's your baby don't let that affect your culture in the company because sometimes you can panic be crazy be just kind of confused mm -hmm. and it's really really important that your you, that doesn't impact on your culture you need yeah. to find an outlet mm -hmm. whether that be yoga or running or meditation that you can't be so single-minded you have to be really balanced and if you are fiery and you are ambitious you've got to find a way to you know release that so that you can make sure that when you come in it's not about what you do or the great people that you have if the culture I've learned a lot like late in life yeah if you're impacting their culture negatively because you're in a bad space, because you haven't done your planning with your life and your kids and you're expanding too fast and you can't cope, leave that stuff at the door, you know, yeah. don't bring it in. And so that's been something that I am um, now in my later life where things more calm, I've really appreciated. Oh my God, so powerful. And the point you mentioned around just starting, when I recorded a podcast, I recorded two and I sat on them for six months because I was like, well, I need to make sure that I've got the good artwork and I need to make sure that I um, have a picture of the guest that looks nice and I need to make sure that I'm gonna add a video or whatever, I had all these things. And I remember one of my friends, they said, you know, are you ever gonna do it? Yeah. And I was like, I am. And they were like, well, you always say it and you're never gonna do it. And I was so angry. I was like, I went onto Canva. I made my Millennial Mind logo, which is still my logo in one night exactly. of a random pa Just page. Just go for it. And I la launched it. And Procrastination how much is the I, evil of all right. entrepreneurship. Just right. get on with it. And now I'm here two and a half years later. Confused. But in the beginning, that is where I wanted to be. And I would have never released those episodes because I would always, always have said like, but I want to do video, I want to have a studio, I want to do this. It's always about starting. Just get And it, get that's going. the fear. But that is the number one, like best advice I received as well. It's like, just start, then figure it out, it'll be okay. Yeah. But honestly, I'm so inspired by you. Honestly, you're one of those Thank people you. I talk about that I meet and I just feel like I want to be you when I'm older. Oh, like, no. <laughs> I'm going to badger you all the time now. But thank you so much for coming thank on. Thank you it's so much such a pleasure. for having me. Yeah, thank you. Hey, everyone. Thank you so much for listening to this podcast. 
wherever you're listening or watching. If you could press the like, follow and subscribe button, it would mean the world to me.